So let's now shift from uh, some of the cultural chef, uh, stuff over to uh, some of the work done by uh, a fabulous fellow by the name of Sylvester Lee. Sly uh, is going to come up and talk to you a little bit about what he's doing with reality computing and how he is helping to make a positive impact here uh, on planet Earth. Come on up, Sly, and talk to folks about the great work you're doing. Thank you. Hello, my mic, here we go. One of the fundamental obstacles I had to overcome as a child of immigrant parents in the Deep South in Mississippi, in a landlocked town, was the issue of access, namely access to the ocean, but also to information. The fact that I'm a marine scientist but never saw the ocean until the age of 14 may sound a bit crazy, and I think it is. But I think reality computing can increase access, especially to resources that are innately difficult to access, such as systems that I'm interested in. Sir David Attenborough is an English naturalist and journalist, a science communicator that's inspired millions through series such as Planet Earth. He said, the single most revelatory three minutes of my life was the first time I put on scuba gear and dived on a coral reef. It's just the unbelievable fact that you can move in three dimensions. Indeed, anyone that's had the incredible opportunity to experience a reef firsthand can understand the freedom of movement that comes with this surreal, otherworldly environment. In addition to being very beautiful, they are very valuable economically, environmentally, and are the literal lifeline for millions of people around the world. We don't know a lot about coral reefs, but there are a few things we know to be true at this time. We know that at bare minimum, they provide $375 billion worth of ecosystem services to humans annually. It's very likely that this number is conservative and that this number is increasing year by year. We also know that coral reefs are a biodiversity hotspot. In fact, some scientists think that they're even more biodiverse than the rainforests. And as a result, they're a huge biomedical potential. Coral reefs are home to fascinating organisms such as this very common looking cone snail. However, the way that it hunts is not very modest. It injects a toxin that is a thousand times more potent than morphine. With Without the side effects of addiction, this drug, this compound has been developed into a pharmaceutical and is on the market today as pre-alt. We also know that corals are very valuable in preventing erosion on shorelines, serving as kind of a natural breakwater. And we also know that corals are very rare. They are the gems of the sea. They cover less than 0.1% of the ocean floor. So we know all these things, but we continue to do things that cause detriment to our environment, to our ecosystem. We're still burning unnatural or unrenewable resources. We're still burning dinosaur bones, for Christ's sakes. So we have all this data. We have all these things that we know, yet we haven't seen the equal and opposite reaction or action to the facts that we've gathered. Cognitive, cognitive scientists will tell you that this may have something to do with the fact that the decision-making part of our brain, the orbital frontal cortex, is innately linked to the emotional part of our brain with a limbic system. I think one of the underlying fundamental parts of this, parts of decision making, has to do with access. Access not only to the information at hand, being able to retrieve it, but also access in terms of being able to digest it, in terms of being able to understand it. Access can increase innovation, allow collaborations, interdisciplinary ideas, but a lack of access can cause a lot of problems. And in the field of coral reef science, this lack of access has meant that coral reef scientific monitoring is drastically behind the times. We have the ability to measure the genomics, proteins, and metabolomics as these organisms change over time on very small time scales, but we lack the very fundamental ability to measure the surface area of a coral, the thin living veneer that constitutes these living organisms. All current measurements try to estimate um, rugosity or complexity using two-dimensional measurements and metrics such as this piece of chain which is the literal chain mail. Also, coral reefs are innately difficult to access. They're underwater. I don't know if you can get much more difficult than that. Maybe space. And as such, visualizations are limited. Not everyone is going to have the incredible opportunity to visit a reef. This reef was one of the most spectacular I've ever seen was in the Maldives and it had 100% coral cover. 
and in this day and age, that is incredibly rare. But if this is the only picture or experience you've had of a coral reef, you could perhaps appreciate the beauty and complexity, but you'd be missing a large part of the experience. You'd be missing a lot of understanding. Last year, I founded a nonprofit called The Hydras. Our name is a play on the word meaning water and the human integration into this vital component, this vital resource. We're trying to bring issues that marine resources, especially coral reefs, face to light. We're also trying to translate data into very digestible, meaningful, emotional experiences to make them very visual and interactive. I'm very passionate about photography. And when I learned about photogrammetry, the fact that you can gather data from photos from the USS Arizona project, I dove headfirst, literally, into seeing what it could do for coral reef environments. Along with Autodesk technologists and engineers, we pioneered a way of capturing corals at incredibly high definition in 3D and in an interactive. -ness. This coral in Palau changed the conversation about where reality computing, reality capture could be useful. And we were very surprised at the amount of detail, the level of detail that we were getting from this. In Hawaii, we scaled up our efforts to see if this could be used in a more quantitative way, in a way to help scientists track coral reef growth over time. For decades, we've lacked this ability. And if this could be precise enough, if the detail was high enough, this could revolutionize the way scientific monitoring of corals happens. And indeed, our preliminary results were very good. You can see some of the detail were down to the coral polyp level, the individual living section of a coral. In Guam, we scaled up once more, capturing a larger section of coral, moving into the community level responses. This is a five meter by seven meter reef in Guam. And in Hawaii, we scaled up once more, capturing this 10 meter by 10 meter swath of reef. The goal is to capture community level responses, get a, better, a big picture idea of what's going on, how are these communities responding to stress over time and also creating a more inversive, um, immersive, interactive environment, getting a whole picture experience of a reef. So I've traveled to all these places last year. A lot of places had very high local stressors and also global stressors. And I wanted to do something, conduct a project, to see if you could have a real world implementation, a real world impact. I chose the Maldives which is a small island nation off the southern coast of India. In addition to being a very beautiful honeymoon destination, it's at the front lines in the battle against climate change. Erosion happens on every island and is a constant struggle. The highest portion of the Maldives is just 2.4 meters. Dolphins can jump higher. Isolation is very apparent as trash can only be burned, buried, or thrown out to sea. So I wanted to work in this place that would have the most impact, the most benefit. Another reason I went to the Maldives was largely inspired by the award-winning documentary, The Island President, which captured the first democratically elected president in 30 years, President Nasheed, as he tried to save his uh, drowning country. It's called the first world nations to decrease their carbon emissions. This battle has been largely postponed. He was overthrown in a coup um, in 2012. So, in December of last year, I set out on a project in collaboration with Dr. Michael Sweet of the University of Derby to do a comprehensive study to see how reefs are changing in response to local stressors, to see how reefs respond and are resilient to bleaching and other stressors, and get a better big picture idea of using this new technology. We also wanted to investigate factors that influence fish resil um, recruitment, resilience, and um, overall fish assemblages. Fish are like humans, they have specific needs. Not every coral provides those same needs. Bouldering corals, such as the one behind me, provide a very different habitat than the uh, finely branching acropids. On our surveys, we observed a lot of bleaching. So coral bleaching is characterized by the loss of this symbiotic or beneficial algae that lives inside the individual coral polyp. A coral can survive if bleached, but it's harder to thrive under those conditions. The lower brown portion of the coral is the living portion, the bleached is the white portion, and the dead coral is the black wake behind it. The bleached coral is still alive, but once it gets to the um, black phase, it is, it is dead, it's been covered with macroalgae. So in this project for the first time, we were able to quantify bleaching. In the past, scientists would have taken out a measuring tape and measured the edges of the bleaching area, but we will be able to 
for the first time. See how bleaching responds, how it grows, how it progresses or, or shrinks and recovers over time. We're really excited about our collaboration with President Nasheed. He's still really active in the international environmental community. But four days ago, I got some terrible news that he had been arrested, um, a pol politically motivated arrest, and charged um, for terrorism. This man, during, as president, tried to increase access to information, tried to increase education, fight corruption, increase sustainable resource usage. He inspired me to come to the Maldives. And after these current events, it inspired me to work even harder towards what we're doing. And what we're doing is increasing access. We're trying to bring this story to the world level to show how important these reefs are, not only in the Maldives, but reefs around the world. In a country like the Maldives, which rely on coral reefs heavily, tourism supports 40% of their GDP. The reefs are everything to them. El Nino is characterized by this natural event of upwelling of warm water over the oceans every few years. The 1998 El Nino caused 90% bleaching on Maldivian reefs. Only 10% of the reefs survived. And as a result, the Maldivian economic, economy just plummeted years afterwards. We gather data before the next El Nino, which actually passed over the Maldives last month. When we go back again this year, we'll be able to gather the same data and deserve bleaching as it happens over time, factors that drive resilience, which will hopefully gain, give some insights into habitat valuation, habitat resilience, and um, help inform marine management decisions. So we gathered all this data from our survey, right? But we know that data doesn't exactly equate to equal and opposite actions. But perhaps data combined with access can. And a large part of what we're doing is creating these very visual, very interactive experiences to help make the data digestible, understandable, to make people care. Jacques Cousteau, the man who pioneered open circuit breathing, marine conservation, marine exploration, said that people protect what they love. But I think people only love what they understand. The goal of our project is to make this understanding, to foster this understanding through these emotional, very visual, interactive experiences to increase access. What does the future hold? Commercial hoverboards? I hope so. But I think we're going to see solutions that we think are just as crazy as hoverboards were back in the day. Today it costs $4,000 to, to make a breakwater off the coast um, on any shore in the Maldives. They're shipping in boulders. Um, from India. It costs $4,000 per cubic meter, sorry. It also costs tens of thousands of dollars more to 3D print a shape that big. But I think one day we will be able to have customizable reefs, customizable breakwaters, with the goal of not replacing or undermining the value of these systems, but with the goal of increasing access, increasing understanding, education of these valuable resources. Coral reefs already inspire design on many levels, from architecture to furniture making to fashion. Do those heels look comfortable? I highly doubt it. But I think it's cool that very, very soon we're going to have the ability to use actual coral geometries, actual coral structures to influence design and inspire artists. One of the most obvious applications of what we're doing is virtual reality. Imagine swimming through a reef, observing the complexities and the beauty, all from your mobile phone or your tablet or your computer at home. We want to create these interactive, immersive experiences. We're really looking forward to working with other people that share these same goals. Over the next few years, I'll be continuing our projects to increase open access to the world's coral reefs. We have a lot of projects lined up this, this year, and we look forward to working with anyone else that would like to do the same. You can see some of the models that were in this presentation at our website. You can also follow the um, fight and movement to free President Nasheed using this hashtag. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Sly.